สวัสดีค่ะครับสวัสดีครับตอนนี้มีใครยังเห็นมีอยู่สองคนที่ไม่ได้เข้า Google Classroom ใช่ไหมครับตอนนี้มีปัญหาเรื่องดาวน์โหลดไฟล์หรือเปล่าเพื่อนมีปัญหาเรื่องอีเมลมหาลัยค่ะซึ่งหนูก็ไม่แน่ใจเหมือนกันว่ามันเป็นปัญหาที่ตรงไหนก็คือทําให้เพื่อนไม่สามารถสมัครไออีเมลที่เป็น .edu ได้พอสมัครไอที่เป็น .edu ไม่ได้ก็เลยเข้า Classroom ไม่ได้ใช่ครับอย่างอย่างของของตรงก็คือว่าเออล็อกล็อกอินแอดสติวเดนแอดมาฮิโดนแล้วครับแต่ว่าพอไปเข้าคัสรูมอ่ะมันต้องเป็น .edu ใช่ป่ะครับมันก็ไม่ไม่บอกว่าไม่ไม่มีอืมครับเหมือนไอหน้าหน้าที่อาจารย์ให้มาครับก็คือลงทะเบียนได้แล้วก็ขึ้นว่าเรียบร้อยแล้วอืมแต่ว่าพอเข้า edu ปุ๊บมันบอกว่าไม่มีอืมอันนี้คือลองล่าสุดลองวันที่อะไรฮะอ่าล่าสุดลองวันจันทร์ครับก็คือเมื่อเมื่อวานเลยวะเมื่อวันซืนอือแตกมากเลยแล้วก็เดี๋ยวเดี๋ยวส่งส่งไฟล์ให้ให้ให้ไว้ก่อนแล้วกันครับครับจานครับผมเห็นมันมีบางบางบางวิชาก่อนหน้านี้คือไม่ไม่จำเป็นต้องใช้ .edu เป็นเป็น Gmail ปกติได้ครับหรือว่าระบบอันนี้มันมันได้ไหมครับจานมันขึ้นอยู่กับเขาสร้างไว้ว่ายังไงครับถ้าเขาสร้างด้วย Gmail ธรรมดาคนที่เป็นเป็นที่เป็น Gmail ธรรมดาก็เข้าได้อืมใช่แต่ถ้าสร้างด้วยเออพอดีดีอมันจะมันจะติดครับคือ Google Microsoft จะคล้ายๆกันนะมันจะพอเราใช้อีเมลออกไนเซชันนะมันจะล็อกแต่จริงอย่างของ Microsoft ที่มันเชิญเชิญคนนอกเข้าไปได้นะแต่ว่าอันนี้ไม่แน่ใจว่ามันไม่ได้แต่ดีคือถ้าได้มันจะสะดวกมากเนี่ยเพราะว่าทุกอย่างอยู่นั้นหมดแต่แต่ไม่เป็นไรครับเดี๋ยวส่งให้กันก่อนได้เพียงแต่ว่าอันนั้นก็เอาไปรวบรวมอย่างอย่างอื่นจะได้อยู่ที่เดียวกันหมดเทอมหน้าจะได้ใช้ต่อจะได้รู้ว่าอยู่ตรงไหนหนึ่งสองสามสี่ห้าหกโอเคโอเคเลสเกตโอเคเลสเกตเลสเกตสตาร์เดนจะสมมติอืมอืมอืมอืมอืมอืมอืมอืมอืมอืมอืมอืมอืมอืมอืมอืมอืมอืมอืมอืมอืมอืมอืมอืมอืมอืมอืมอืมอืมอืมอืมอืมอืมอ
Okay, sorry. Um, let's review what we learned last time um, just a little bit, okay? Um, so last time we talked about the sequence analysis and we have learned about the BLAST program, right? Uh, BLAST is a suite of programs. So there are many programs inside BLAST suite and we can use it for, uh, I mean, nowadays, um, if you look at the BLAST interface, the web, uh, web application, you will see that um, there are so many things that you can do, not just uh, searching for the sequence in the database, but you can do so many, so many different things. And there are so many re related informations available and you can just pretty much uh, explore, explore uh, everything from uh, the BLAST interface. So today we're gonna try to um, integrate we, we try to um, continue from, from last time because uh, today's topic is pretty much uh, related to what we already talked about. So we're gonna, uh, we're gonna go to the NCBI database again and then, uh, okay, do you see? You see the screen I'm sharing? Okay. Um, let, let's go to... You can just search GenBank. Let's go to GenBank, GenBank database. Yeah, you can uh, Google GenBank and go to the website. And you can select protein right, from the list. Let's uh, look at the protein sequence. So you go to the protein and then you can type TP53. And click search. And you should see something like this, you know, um, the three, uh, TP53 is a gene, it's a tumor protein P53 gene in human. <clears throat> and uh, so uh, some other different names for, for this gene and you can see the gene ID. And below the gene ID, you're gonna see a list of uh, reference, uh, like information, reference sequence information, like transcripts, proteins and genes. So um, this is pretty uh, expectable, you know, you have a single gene that can, uh, that actually encode many different transcript and protein. And for this gene, actually, the number of reference transcripts and the reference proteins are actually the same, right? So you have 15 reference proteins and also 15 reference transcripts. This, this means that um, this single gene can actually produce, you know, many, many different kinds of uh, proteins and transcripts. So uh, you can go to um, uh, reference sequence gene here to see the information about uh, the gene. Okay, so this is the reference sequence. So, um, you can look at uh, the coding sequence, the transcript and the protein of the gene, right? And if you want to search for the homolog, the homolog sequence of this gene, you can go, you can click at the run blast link on the right hand side and you can go to the blast program. And you see you know, the programs actually, um, the program has inputted, inserted the, the gene ID for you automatically. So that's pretty easy. 
So let's see if we would like to uh, search for uh, we're not going to try to search. So this is a nucleotide, right? So we are not going to try to I think the nucleotide is not going to be that useful. So let, let's go back a little bit. Let's go back a little bit. So this one is actually um, if you click run blast here, it's going to uh, run a blast against your nucleotide sequence, the nucleotide sequence of this gene. So we, we're not going to do that. Let's go back one more time and go to the reference sequence, sequence protein instead, RepC proteins instead, because we, we would like to search for protein sequences, not, uh, not the gene sequence. Okay, so you can see um, the protein sequence is only uh, 393 amino acids long. Right? And you know, there are some other uh, isoforms, like isoform A, B, C, D, E. So uh, many different isoforms are encoded by this gene. And then you can click run blast, and this time it's going to insert the accession number here to the BLAST program, which is NP, blah, blah, blah. Right? So you can get a, a protein sequence. Okay, so when you click BLAST, you're gonna get like the whole, pretty much all the sequences from that page. And suppose that we just want to, you know, search for just one sequence. So just delete other sequences and keep the first one. And we are going to search for um, homologous sequences in maybe reference protein alone, right? We're not going to try to search for a very big database like the non redundant protein sequences because it's going to take so long. So let's try to search for the reference sequence. So you can select a uh, RepSeq protein database because we're going to see, we want, we like to get. Uh, similar sequences from uh, other organisms and a human. Okay, and then uh, you select last P, which is the protein protein blast. And then we're going to leave all the parameters as default and then click blast button. And this is going to take a while because um, the RevC protein database is quite big. So the bigger the database, the longer it's going to take. Um, we just have to wait a little bit. So my still running. So you guys done? Um, while we're waiting for the result, I'm gonna go through, uh, I'm gonna go over some, uh, some useful features of the new BLAST program. Um, this is what we looked at last time, uh, is a table that show 
some numbers that uh, indicate the similarity and the quality of the alignment, right? Um, I think by now you should be uh, at least familiar with um, these terms uh, already, like the max score and the total score. You can see when uh, there's only one region that actually match has a high score uh, of a similarity with uh, the query sequence. If you if there's only one region, you know that's you know has a high enough score, you're gonna see uh, that the max score and total score are the same. But if there are more than one regions, you might see uh, that the max score and the total score might be a little bit different because the max score is from the, the region that has the highest score. But the total score is pretty much from uh, all the regions combined. And you can see the query cover, which is, means um, that the sequences actually align pretty much from one end to the other end. I mean, if you see the 100% at the query cover, it's the pretty much tells you the coverage of the, the, the alignment, the coverage of the sequence and the, the, the mesh. So this one is from, uh, it means that uh, every nucleotide, pretty much like every nucleotide aligns from the, the one end to the other end. And the E-value indicates um, the likelihood that the sequence actually matched by, by chance. <clears throat> pretty much by uh, like the, the probability that the query is actually matched to the random sequence. And when you see the, uh, the zero here, it means that the probability is too low. It's like very, very low. So it could be like one to the, you know, minus 20 or minus 10, for example. So it's, it's very low. So it's not gonna, so the real value is not shown here, but it just the zero means that this is very low. So this one means, uh, uh, you can see the score is very good. I mean, this is like, the first one is like the highest one. This is a default choice. You can change this um, setting so that you can see different kind of um, uh, result. Uh, different, uh, maybe you can sort it by E-value or something else. But this one, it, uh, it just tell you that uh, the sequence actually has a pretty high similarity with the with this with with our uh, sequence, which is a TP53 in human. And uh, this is not gonna be shouldn't be uh, like happen by chance, right? It should be happens because it's actually a a real homologous sequence, basically. And then the percent identical means that uh, our sequence actually 100% identical to uh, this sequence. Okay, so um, you can also go down and look at, uh, it's not going down anymore. If you click another, like um, another tab right here, you're gonna see a graphic summary. And you can see um, some uh, graphical representation of the, the protein domain that are well known. For example, the P53 is very well known protein domain. So it's actually shown here. And you can see that uh, it's located in the middle of the sequence, the amino acid sequence. And you can also see some other uh, protein domain as well. And below you're gonna see uh, like all 100 sequences that align to our query. And you can see when you see um, the, red, uh, the red thin line here that align from one end to the other end, that's actually 100% coverage. And also um, it's gonna give you a very good uh, like um, uh, not not a score, but uh, it's a good coverage because you see it's a band from uh, amino acid number one to the last amino acid, right? compared to some other sequences that align with high score, but it's it's not does not span from you know the amino acid number one to the last one. So you see some. Uh, 
uh, some part of the amino acid that actually not aligned to our query. And this happens because uh, we are using the local alignment. Right? The, the protein itself actually might be longer than this, but the part that actually aligns with our sequence is only, you know, is, is, is not that long because uh, when you use BLAST, it's gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna align until uh, the score drops significantly. So if it actually runs from the middle to the left and you see that after this position, um, the score drops like dramatically, it's gonna stop doing uh, the alignment. That's why you can see um, some sequence kind of shorter than uh, our query, but that's pretty normal. And you can also look at the alignment, right? Uh, like this one has, um, 100% identity. So it's like everything is pretty much the same, but this is not, um, you have to be careful. You know, this one, although it looks so good, but it's actually a predicted uh, protein sequence. So it's not real. It's predicted probably from the genome sequence or even human genome sequence. So it's not gonna be real. That's why, you know, the percentage Look, looks too good, like looks very good, 100% identical. And if you look, uh, if you go down a little bit more, you're gonna see um, some, like for example, this one, there are actually some variation in um, the alignment, right? Some proteins actually not identical, like this one. Oh, sorry. No. And as you go further and further, you're gonna see um, a lot more uh, differences in, 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 the, in the alignment. Okay, like this one, you're gonna see, um, there's a huge gap here that actually <clears throat> uh, inserted in order to align uh, our query to, the, to this sequence, which means that um, this, this sequence actually uh, probably uh, like just this part of the sequence probably deleted from, from, from this sequence. Okay. So this is um, pretty much what we learned last time, right? We learned how to use BLAST. We learned about all the parameters that we can adjust. So we can do some sort of um, sequence alignment and this is this one we call a pairwise alignment because we actually compare or align two sequences at a time that's why we call pairwise alignment and actually uh, nowadays you can also uh, do something like uh, you can you know choose different uh, way that you can see the alignment like this one is going to be a lot cleaner because uh, if, if there's no difference you're going to see the dot instead of you know exact same amino acids so this is very good for you to spot uh, the differences see now you can see the difference between um, the sequence and and the, the one that matched your sequence a lot easier like this one is a lot easier for you to spot the differences like mutation for example, this is pretty cool. You know, it's, yeah, it's getting better and better. <laughs> Let's try another one. If you cannot, if you're not following, just uh, let me know, okay? So I'm gonna keep going and going, but if you're not following, just let me know. So this one is gonna be good for you. This view is, um, it's good when you want to compare uh, many, many different sequences at the same time. So now you can see all the, like you can see the, the same position in other sequences. For example, in uh, the query, in this position, the query is E and then you see uh, in some sequences, uh, this position is the same, but some other sequences you see A instead of E. And even 
D, for example. Okay. So let's let's try the last one. Flat query anchor with dots for identities. <clears throat> Okay, so this is another way to uh, visualize um, the sequences. I'm not quite sure if I understand uh, the meaning of the, the dash here, but I think you can find um, some uh, information somewhere. Yeah, I'm not sure about, I mean, I haven't seen this one before, so I'm, I'm not sure uh, what it means, but it should be, uh, it should tell you pretty much the same thing. Like you can compare uh, the amino acid. I mean, each position in different sequences at the same time. Okay, so any question about, about this part, which is just the, the alignment? Okay. Um, so we're gonna move on to another topic that actually uh, quite related to what we're gonna learn today, uh, which is the taxonomy, which is um, the one that telling you like how many sequences uh, that actually match your sequence from, from each uh, group of animals or, or organisms. So um, you can see, uh, the first column here is the name of the organism uh, organized by um, a classification starting from eutheria down to like uh, primates, uh, hominid, and then you know those uh, monkeys that look like us. So I, I don't know all the terms, but uh, it's basically organized by um, by classification. Okay, um, sorry. Sorry, sorry, I was cut somehow. Okay, um, when was I last time? <laughs> when were we last time? Do you know? Are you guys back? Hello, are you guys back? Hello. Okay, so, so when, 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 when were we last time? Before we were cut? Uh, uh, I'm going to start uh, lectures in a part of the day. In, in, in okay, okay, uh, okay. Um, let me share the screen again. Actually, I was not going to start the lecture yet, but I was just going to talk about the taxonomy. Okay, uh, I just uh, wanted to show you this one is um, the taxonomy from uh, BLAST. Actually, BLAST has very good uh, taxonomy database. So if you want to explore pretty much all kind of uh, living things in the world, you can actually go come to NZBI taxonomy database and search uh, it's going to give you a lot of, you know, uh, information about all the living things and how they are classified. So um, this is pretty useful and I believe that um, not many scientists, not many biologists actually, uh, especially in, in medical field, care so much about um, this result because mostly we work on human, right? we don't, and, or maybe mouse or some uh, model organisms that we use to test for uh, clinical trials, for example. So we don't really care so much about um, uh, other organisms, but if you work in some other fields, uh, this is gonna give you a lot of information, especially if you are actually uh, studying non-model organisms or some kind of non, um, like uh, new, if you want to like study new genes for, or new genome, for example, this is going to be very useful because most of the time you're going to have to uh, compare 
your sequences or your, your, uh, the organism that you study with uh, other organisms because there is not enough information for the organism that you study or the gene that you are interested in if it's really new. So that's why, um, I mean, if you, for example, work with uh, some other like animals that does not, that do not have the genome uh, yet, for example, so there'll be no uh, genome, no information, no data for the genome and genes. So you're gonna rely on, you know, information from other organisms. So I think it's good for you to um, take a look at this stuff uh, so that in, in the future, when you run into this kind of, or maybe you have a chance, you know, to work in, in a lab that actually uh, study something that not uh, commonly known you're gonna know like where you're gonna look for the data, look for information. And this is uh, quite interesting because um, BLAST can give you, uh, it's already show you like how many, how many of the sequences from each organism actually match your sequence. Uh, so you, you kind of know that, okay, uh, this gene is pretty common in what type of animals, for example. So for this one, uh, you have a very high score or hit uh, match, and hit is pretty much the same uh, the same thing, right? You get a good match or hit here. It means that uh, your your gene is pretty um, uh, it's pretty common in uh, in primates, for example, because you know all the top sequences with the highest score from primates, and also in rodents. So you get uh, a good uh, hit in rodent as, as well. So in like primate mammals and you know, this is pretty interesting where right? you see um, hit from like animals like whales and dolphins. So these genes are actually pretty, um, it's a common gene among like mam uh, mammals, vertebrate and mammals. Even bats, you see. So this kind of give you a very good uh, overview of uh, you, where you can find your gene. So this is you know, interesting for, especially for me when I was working on uh, the next gene sequencing because I was hoping to find, uh, to identify novel genes from RNA sequencing. So um, I heard that you learned a lot about RNA sequencing, sequencing like the last two days from a jump zone. So, one of the application of the next gen sequencing is to sequence the gene uh, from the animal, from the cells, for example. And many, many times you're going to get some genes that that not annotated before, which is, you know, and it, which means that it's new, it's new, and nobody knows what it does, what's the the function of the gene is, and when you blast that gene against the database, you can you know look at you know all this information and you can see you you can tell that you know maybe your gene are actually um, like found in what kind of animals and that's going to tell you a lot about uh, what kind of genes that you're looking at for example if your genes actually um, has a lot of hits in animals like fish olive fish not primate not vertebrates, not mammals, you can tell that, okay, this gene has something to do with fish, like fish specific function, for example. So this is only uh, 100, 100 sequences selected. So this gene might be, um, I mean, it could be found in a lot more animals, but because we limit our result to only 100 sequences. That's why we only see like um, this much information. So if you expand your result to maybe a thousand, uh, I think you could see a lot more, which you can do pretty easily. Um, let me go back to, I believe we have to go back to um, maybe from, the, the beginning. 
yeah, uh, and then you can choose. No, should it be? I don't, I don't quite remember. Um, yeah, this is uh, where you can select, you know, the max target sequences. So if you select like, you know, 5,000 and you run the blast again, yeah, this is gonna take a while, but you're gonna see a lot more uh, hits from like other animals. But don't, don't, don't forget that, you know, right now we're using a uh, low sum 62, which is the default. So um, it's not gonna span, uh, I mean, your search scope is not gonna span uh, across like all kinds of like animal, bacteria, archaea, for example, because you know, those are gonna be too far from, from human. So this, this is something that you have to keep in mind as well. So if you really know like, you know, uh, what type of animals that has uh, this sequence, this gene, you're gonna have to span, uh, change the, the metrics, right? To allow for searching for um, distantly related animals, as well as uh, increasing your, your search target. So that's why I think um, when you perform like the sequence analysis or when you kind of uh, want to explore new genes like this, you're gonna have to play with you know, the, the program several times. It's not gonna be just one time and you're done. You have to play with uh, parameters. You have to look at the result and compare what happens when you change the parameters. Do you see something that uh, interesting? So this is not like, it's more like an art, you know, in, in doing science, not like, a, there's no uh, rules that you just, you know, follow blindly. You just have to try to look at the result and make sense of the result. So that's a, that's a difficult part. Especially when you work with something new that, you know, there's no right answer. So you just, you know, investigate a new gene, for example, nobody can tell if uh, what you get actually accurate or not, but you have to make sure that you get enough information in order to conclude something. Right? And then you can go do um, experiment to, to uh, test your hypothesis. Okay, uh, it's already finished and Let's see how many sequences I have. There should be a lot um, to see, you know, there's a lot more sequences because I increased the max target sequences to like a thousand or 5,000. So there's a lot more. And let me show you, oh, okay. See now you can, uh, you can actually change the, I just saw this one, you can just change from here. It should work the same. Hmm. It's like it's not, uh, it's not fully loaded. I can't select anything. Okay, it's too slow. Hmm. Okay, um, it's not um, fully loaded yet. And now I think it's, it is completed now. I cannot select anything. 
maybe um, I think the sequence, the, the number of sequences is, is just too big. So uh, it takes so long for, for blast to load. Interesting. Okay, let's look at the top uh, the taxonomy again. Okay, let ask me to select the sequence. I'm gonna click. Okay, right now I have uh, three thousand hits, and I'm gonna go to the taxonomy. It's gonna take a while. This is a problem, you know, when you want to work with um, a large group of sequences, it's gonna take so long. That's why um, sometimes it's better for you to set up uh, the BLAST database on your own computer and you can uh, run everything on your own computer. It's going to be a lot faster than uh, using the web interface, but you have to know something about setting up the database <laughs> and that's a problem. Okay, so now we have a lot more uh, diverse kind of animals. Right? You see uh, uh, something like uh, insect. Insectivores, I think it should be something that I should eat insects like some kind of birds that actually eat insects or maybe bats. And you see those um, like kangaroo stuff, like presentos, marsupials, even like turtles and lizards and snakes, for example. So you see a lot more diverse um, kind of animals, even like crocodiles. So this gene is pretty, um, like, I think it's pretty, um, common in many, many of organisms. So the function would be something that actually um, important for, for biology in general. So it's not like, it, should not, it shouldn't serve uh, a very specific function. I think it should serve function that actually uh, general, a like common function that required in many, many different uh, living things. Like you see like fishes here, see? So it's found in fish, found in like so many different, different animals, even like mice and ticks. So um, this is a gene that you know, if you, you know, know about the genes or if you go read uh, all the publications on GenBank about the genes, you should find that actually this is, has something to do with the, the DNA sequence, right? So um, that's why it's so common common in many, many different organisms, like even flies, moths and flies, even like corals. This is a very diverse, you know, type of animals. Uh, but, you know, um, the, uh, the similarity is gonna be a lot lower than, than the one in, um, in the, than, than those in our um, group of animals. Okay, so, okay, let's see if we go down, it's gonna be, hmm, let me check this. Let me look at some uh, sequences that are much different from, from our sequence, from TP53, from human. Let's see what happened. This take a long time because it's kind of um, there are many many different sequences. It's taking too long. I think, you know, as you go like uh, 
farther and farther from uh, human, you're going to see a lot of uh, variations like this. You know, you see many different um, uh, amino acid substitutions and maybe insertion, deletion, and you're going to see that um, the, the sequence that actually matched our query is going to get shorter and shorter in um, other organisms, in distantly related organisms, because uh, only the part that actually important will be conserved, but the part that is not um, functionally important will be uh, modified, will change. So um, it's something that you can expect and you can see from here. That's why I want to show you, uh, like as you go farther and farther, from human, you're going to see that, you know, the, the sequences kind of um, has a lot more uh, mutations or substitutions. I would, I would not want to say uh, mutation because uh, when you talk, when you, uh, when you say mutation, it has something to do with the wild type. And this is not, you know, we're not comparing uh, a wild type with, um, with uh, the mutation type. We, we, we are actually comparing. Uh, different organisms. So I think the good term would be uh, substitutions instead of mutation. Uh, because, um, I mean, during the evolution, uh, some amino acid gets substituted by mutation, but you know, it's not, it has kind of a little bit uh, slightly different meaning. So you see, I mean, there are many, many more uh, substitutions when you go. Uh, when you look at, you know, the, the animals that are not closely related to human. For example, if you look at, I don't know what this animal is, but uh, let's see some animals I know. The name is so not familiar. So this is actually, um, if you look at the percent identities, it's not that low, it's only like 84%. So I think it's still uh, somewhat uh, related to human. Now let, me, let me look it up, auto lemur. Oh, this is a, a lemur, I guess, as a name imply, auto lemur. Yeah, it's actually a lemur, which is also a mammal. So, the lemur is also a, lamb, a mammal, kind of mammal, I think. Oh, it's a primate. That's why the percent identity is still like 84%. So it's not, it's not that low. 84% is quite high. So you have to go a lot you know, further <laughs> to see um, those animals in um, like some other kingdoms or you know, some other group of animals like fish, for example. So I think we're gonna finish uh, looking at the blast we saw at this point. And we're gonna continue to some other uh, interesting things. And if you look at the blast result, you're gonna see some other information that quite related to what we're going to talk about today. And the first one is the distant tree of results. So this one is going to give you um, a distant tree from the pairwise comparison. Uh, let me show you first. And then I'm going to explain what it is. Because the number of sequences is kind of large, oh, it's gonna take so long. Let me cancel this one and limit uh, the number of the search, the number of the sequences to maybe only 100. Should be faster. 5,000 is too much, maybe to 500. Let's see what happens. Okay, so I'm gonna go to distant tree again.
So it's taking toll so long. Maybe the number of sequences too many. Uh, let me change it one more time. This time only a hundred should be faster. Okay, try again. I don't know, but maybe um, I try this one at home and it's a lot faster. <laughs> the internet here is not that good. Um, hopefully it's gonna show something soon. So in the meantime, let's see, uh, let, let's look at uh, the multiple alignment. So this is something that we're gonna talk about today uh, because it's uh, needed for uh, building the phylogenetic tree. Oh, okay. So this is the BLAST program that actually perform uh, multiple sequence alignment. And I'm gonna explain what it is later, but uh, I, I wanna show you how it looks like first, and you're gonna see uh, what you get from performing. Oh, something, something went wrong. <laughs> okay, no problem. Um, we're gonna try this again later, and we're gonna we can use like some other tools as well, not not just blast, but. Um, Anyway, I mean, uh, you can use BLAST to do, to perform multiple sequence alignment and then, or some, as, uh, some other program. And you can also use uh, the multiple sequence alignment viewer to visualize the alignment of your sequences. And this is quite good because um, you use BLAST to search for homologous sequences and then you can perform multiple sequence alignment right away. So that's gonna be very easy. But the thing is, um, for people who care about building uh, a good, like a, a more accurate phylogenetic tree or people who work on building um, 3D structure of the protein, they will not use um, the result here right away. They, they're gonna have to edit. Sometimes you have to modify um, the sequence alignment, the multiple sequence, sequence alignment by hands to make sure that actually everything um, aligned correctly because the program can do what it, you know, what it can, but it's not going to be perfect every time. So um, this is good for you know, for a brief like uh, look of how the sequence alignment looks like. But uh, when people when people want to build to really use the the result from the alignment, they actually have to sometimes they have to modify or edit the alignment. Otherwise, gonna get the wrong result. I mean, for some reason, you know, BAS is not working here. So uh, we're gonna move on, and we can come back to this one later. But I just want to show you that you know there are so many different things, and um, that you can do on BAS. I, I would recommend you know you you know watch the videos here on YouTube about BAS, and you know there are so many different things that it's gonna keep um, it, will, it will get added to BAS like in the future, or maybe something will be deprecated. So it's gonna change a lot. Uh, it's good for you to get yourself, you know, familiar with, with, with it and know how to get help, know how to read the, the document. Because it's gonna be one of the, I think it's gonna be one of the most viable uh, databases and tools for biologists for a really long time. And many, many, many tools actually in bioinformatics rely so much on BLAST database. So, um, I mean, it's good for you to get, you know, to, to know uh, what, what, what it has to offer. 
Okay, um, we could, we're gonna come back to this one later and uh, I'm gonna give you a homework today as well so you can uh, learn you know, something about BLAST later. And I don't think we're gonna finish, um, I think we're gonna finish a little bit early today so that you can go do the homework because I don't want you to do the homework uh, outside classroom because um, we, we learn, we study every day, that's gonna be a lot if you have to spend another two hours, one hours outside classroom, it's gonna be uh, too much. And because um, in our class, it's supposed to, in, actually we only have um, one hour for lecture and two hours for practice. So uh, I should let you, you know, practice uh, by yourself in, 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 in class. Okay, um, let's go on. Okay, um, so today we're gonna to talk about very, one of the most complicated topics in bioinformatics. Uh, it's the phylogenetics. It's quite complicated and um, there are so many different tools that you can use and also the concept is pretty difficult to grasp if you're not familiar with um, molecular biology, for example, or even like the evolution in general. So. If you have any question in terms of um, like concept or uh, evolution theory, you can ask me and I'm gonna to try to answer as much as I can. And uh, let me tell you that you can actually do a PhD just uh, in phylogenetics alone. <laughs> so it's, it's a field that is big enough that you can do a PhD research just by uh, building the phylogenetics alone. So that's, that's something that uh, you can keep in mind. I have friends that are actually an expert in building phylogenetics. So uh, it, you can make a career out of building phylogenetics because it's, it's complex. You know, it's a complex topic and it's not easy to understand. And it involves a lot of like mathematics or, and statistics, for example. So, and, and you, if you want to really understand, um, like in detail, you have to know, know something about the, the computer, the computer and algorithms actually build the phylogenetics. So we're not gonna try to touch everything here and just enough for you to have a good, um, uh, just for you to have a good idea about what it is and how you're gonna use that for, use it for um, exploring uh, biology more. But if you want to build phylogenetics for your own research, you should actually seek advice from someone who knows how to do it. You know, don't, don't go do it just from this class alone. Right? It's not gonna be that easy. And there's so many things that you have to, to know uh, when you build a real phylogenetics for your research. So what, what's, what's good about phylogenetics? Uh, actually, it's used a lot uh, in research article, especially for uh, host and pathogens interaction. Right? There are so many studies that show uh, how, I mean, how hosts are shaped by pathogens and how pathogens are actually shaped by the host. And most of them, most of the time, they actually co-evolve, for example. So it's pretty, um, uh, I mean, there are so many scientists actually use phylogenetics to study that. And also you can look at the protein evolution and also genome evolution in the same way, right? You can compare the protein of the organisms that are new to maybe an organism that actually kind of old or um, diverged from, diverged from like million, million years ago, for example. And you can see how the proteins actually evolve over time. And that's quite important is that uh, if you are a medical technologist, for example, one thing that you're gonna hear a lot is uh, many microorganisms like viruses, uh, bacteria and fungi actually get classified, reclassify like once a year, every year basically, like bacteria, for example. Um, uh, like in the past, some bacteria is actually mostly identified by the phenotype, 
for example, like how they consume or ferment some sugars, for example. But you know, nowadays, uh, many many uh, microbiologists rely on um, genome sequence for identification and classification. So you're gonna see many times like uh, some bacteria actually they may have um, a phenotype that actually is similar to a group of one group of bacteria, but actually classify in another group of bacteria because of the genome sequence. And you have to keep in mind that you know, if you're a biologist, um, uh, the bacteria can, has, uh, can have a, a genome that's similar to one group of bacteria, but it doesn't mean that they have to behave in the same way. So this is something that quite um, complicated in biology because um, you may have the bacteria that looks so much in terms of genome sequence, look so much like one bacteria, but they behave totally different from, from you know, uh, bacteria with, in, in that group. So when we, as a medical technologist or microbiologist, work on those bacteria, it's going to be confusing, you know, for us, because, you know, when you look at a group, you know, they don't look alike at all. Like many, many phenotypes are different, but uh, in textbook, it's going to be classified in that group anyway due to uh, the similarity of the genome sequence. So this is something that um, I don't think, I don't know which one is going to be uh, more useful, but for me, I think if we look at like medical my, my microbial, um, like medical microbes, for example, I think the phenotype is going to be a lot more uh, important for the patient, for, uh, for the, the lab technicians than the genome sequences. But you know, in, in, in uh, nowadays, there's so many tests that actually um, can uh, sequence the genome of the bacteria very quickly, like the next gen sequencing, for example. So um, maybe in the future, you don't have to rely so much on the phenotype anymore because you can just, you know, uh, sequence the bacteria out of the specimen, directly from the specimen, for example. So you can tell like how many bacteria are there and what types of bacteria are there without even looking at um, the biochemical test, for example, or even the, the shape of the, the colony on the plate, for example. So this is something that, um, uh, that is applied to uh, the medical lab laboratory. And, and nowadays when we talk about um, the drug resistant bacteria, we also talk a lot about the genes that actually uh, spread it uh, throughout the hospitals and even in the community. So you can, um, if you can compare the genome sequence and the plasmid of the bacteria, that contain the resistant genes, you can, you can tell how those bacteria actually come from, like where, where, where is the origin of the, the spreading, for example. So that's gonna be useful for um, investigation. But anyway, when it takes, I mean, all these techniques are available, but it's kind of you know, expensive right now to do that. But maybe in the future, uh, it could be um, less expensive and become a very common. So this is the first thing that you have to, to understand is the tree in terms of phylogenetics is just a hypothesis. It's not a fact, right? It's not a fact. So when you look at the tree, you have to keep in mind that that's actually a model. It's not a real fact. It's not a fact. It's just a hypothesis or a model about the evolution history. So we talk about evolutionary history, not about a future. So it's something we just, you know, we try our best to guess what looked like in the past, but not, no, we're not so sure that it's going to be correct and accurate. And um, there are many different ways that you can build uh, the tree. So we, it's hard to tell which one is correct. And tomorrow, uh, tomorrow we're going to talk about um, a paper that actually just published not long ago, like just recently about uh, the SARS-CoV-2 virus genome and its phylogenetic tree. And you're gonna see there's a lot of um, debate and discussion going on about the accuracy of the, the study. 
due to you know biases and due to um, limitation of the data collection. So that's just something that quite you know interesting when you look at the paper when people debate that your results are not correct and it's quite difficult to tell um, you know it is true or not. But but it's something that you know is. Um, there's a saying that goes like in scientific um, community that um, a model is not correct, but it's good enough. <laughs> that is something that we care, you know, it's not going to be correct. So every time you build a phylogenetic tree, it's not going to be correct, but it's good enough for you to understand something that's okay. Right? That, 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 that works too. So it doesn't have to be 100% accurate because it's impossible. So uh, usually when we talk about phylogenetic tree, we can uh, look at the, the tree that actually the simplest, right? The simplest, which is the simple enough that, you know, can explain everything that you want to explain. You, we're not going to try to build the most complex tree ever. We try to build the simplest one, but it's good enough, you know, it's simple, but it's good enough to explain whatever you want to explain. And uh, here it's very important. We talk about traits, which is more like a phenotype. So, but it could be some anything, right? It could be a phenotype, it could be behavior, it could be genome sequences. So traits here means so many different things, depend on, depending on what, what you're looking at, right? If you're looking at behavior or if you're looking at uh, morphology, your tree is gonna have to be built in order to explain the relationship between uh, maybe organisms in terms of morphology. If you're looking at uh, behavior, your tree should explain the relationship, you know, with uh, the uh, between the animals in terms of behavior. If you're looking at the genome sequences, your tree should be able to explain the differences or similarity between organisms in terms of genome sequences. So you build a tree to explain the tree that you're interested in, right? not everything. And you know, if you're looking at uh, different uh, characteristics or traits, you might see different tree. So there's no like correct tree that's gonna explain like all the traits, for example. Like, even the same group of animals, uh, you could see different trees uh, depending on what traits that you're looking at. The same thing happened with the genome and gene sequence. If you, for example, looking at the primate and you build a tree of the primates with the genome sequence, it might look different from uh, building a tree of the primates from some genes that you select. It could be a lot different because genes and genome, um, it actually evolved differently, right? Okay, this is how the tree uh, should look like, right? It should have um, a root at the bottom and, you know, a, to uh, a tip of the tree at the top and then you can see all the branches on the side and, you know, the branches can also um, uh, can also have lots of, uh, lots of branches and also at the end of the, the branches we'll call a leaf. That's going to be the terminal of the branch. And this is, you know, um, just the depict um, uh, a, a, uh, I think it's a drawing that actually depict the tree of the man. And, you know, in the past, this is not actually correct because this one gives you a notion of a man is actually the best, be like the highest organism in the world, but which is not true anymore. Nowadays, we don't, we don't usually say, um, say that uh, which animal is more advanced or more evolved than other animals. It's not, that, that is not true in science anymore. So even we can do so many things that, you know, fish cannot do, or we can do so many things that um, birds cannot do. We cannot also do, we can also do, uh, we cannot do so many things that those animals can do as well. So it actually, um, it's not about who is advanced than who anymore, right? It's just, how you actually fit the environment, right? We, we can't live under the water, basically, for example. So we, we're not better than fish 
in terms of living in the water. So uh, this is not a really good, I mean, it's a good image that show you how the tree of life uh, should look like, but it's not uh, the concept of, you know, a uh, human that uh, to be placed on top of our other organism is not accepted anymore. It's not politically accepted anymore. So this is something that looks a lot more like a real phylogenetic tree that we, uh, we are going to study and uh, more accepted nowadays. You see that uh, we are not actually on the top uh, of the tree anymore. It's just, you know, it's just a picture that actually represents the real uh, evolution history. Um, and you can see that actually um, in our group, you know, which is the primates, uh, we actually uh, evolved from maybe some other mammals, a group of mammals long, long, long ago, like many, many million years ago. And then we kind of um, diverged many, many, many times right? along, uh, along the evolutionary tree. And you can see um, at one point, uh, we actually uh, diverged from the the ancestor of you know human and apes and then we become human and you know there are so some other uh, humanoid which is um, the living things that look like human also diverge from apes as well so we're not the only one that actually um, evolved from the ancestor of human and ape but there are so many different species of human that actually evolved and you know nowadays we are the one that actually survive but if you go back in times like 200,000 years ago, you were gonna see many, many humanoids or human species that look like us, look pretty much like uh, Homo sapiens, but they're not Homo sapiens, like Australopithecus, Homo erectus, for example. So, um, the, the divergence between uh, divergence between apes and humans actually occurred seven million years ago. So that's a long, long time. It's not uh, just happened like recently. It takes like seven million years ago for us to actually diverge from uh, the common ancestor. Here we call uh, the red point. Here we say it's a common ancestor. So basically, if you look at the tree, you're gonna see like this. You know. The branching points is always a common ancestor, right? So the branch actually represent uh, more like a speciation. So if you see the branch, it means that that's another species. And if you see the branching point, it's gonna represent the common ancestor, right? Because we don't usually know what is the common ancestor and how it looks like, but um, we usually see uh, the species that evolve or diverge from the common ancestor. So any question about the, the tree here is pretty simple, right? You're looking at the branch and you see the animals, the species, and you're looking at uh, the branching point, you're gonna see um, the common ancestor. So this is quite interesting. Um, recently, I and mean, not recently anymore, it's like many years ago, uh, when I was a PhD student, uh, it's pretty um, exciting to, to know that uh, people actually sequenced the, the ancient human, like humanoids, like Neanderthals um, and Denisovans. Uh, those are humanoids that actually live like many, many thousand years ago. And they found that actually um, our genomes, our like modern human genomes actually contain a lot of the genome of the Neanderthals and the Denisovans. So have you heard about this story before? I would recommend you, you know, go and read the, the article here that I list at the end of the slide, at the bottom of the slide. Uh, what happened was um, uh, like many thousand years ago, like 65,000 years ago, 
uh, there were many different like humanoids, like many humans on Earth, and you know they actually um, like they actually ran into each other. Basically, they they lived together on the Earth, and somehow they actually bred together as well. They breed it. They actually made it, and then uh, that's why we how we that's that's how we get the genome. So we, I mean, they are they can they can mate and they can produce offspring. So we get some part of the genome from Denisovans and also from the Andersons. And many people believe that actually those Denisovans and the Andersons they do not they did not um, extinct. They didn't go extinct, but they basically just merged with the modern human. So somehow we all merged into a modern human. So that's why they, are, they, they went extinct because they just merged with the modern human. So in every one of us, you know, like for example, Asian people has at least like 5%, I think, I remember, not sure, but about 5% of the Denisovans genome, like Chinese people and Thai people, for example. And the European people have a lot more Neanderthals genome in their in their genome uh, gene in their genome. Okay, uh, you've seen this one before, and I just want to point out that um, the terminal node, which is the end of the branch, uh, is called uh, the taxonomic unit, right? the TU here. And it's called the taxonomic unit, which is the the taxonomic unit. Could be anything like could be species, could be gene, could be whatever, but it's going to be uh, located at the end of the node. And uh, the branching point actually is called the internal node, like this one. Uh, let me show you the laser pointer. So here it's actually going to be um, the internal node, which is the common ancestor, right here is the internal node. Yes, internal node. But a terminal node is going to be the taxonomic unit, which is, uh, it could be a species, it could be uh, some other stuff, the like genes, for example. And usually, um, when you form the tree, uh, those uh, animals or trees that are similar to each other is going to be located like next to each other, like this. And those that are actually different from uh, like from each other is going to be located far from each other. And you can see the relationship uh, within a tree by looking at how far apart they are from each other on the tree. And actually, um, the length of the branch actually can represent in terms of the evolutionary time, like how many, how many years that they actually evolve. So the longer the length, it means that uh, the longer time that uh, it, it took to, to evolve, for example. But this one, you know, is um, the length of the branch actually represents uh, the number of substitution per site. So the longer the branch means that, uh, means that there are more substitutions of the amino acid or nucleotide uh, in the gene or the genome of those animals. So this is something that I'm personally interested. Uh, I really are uh, interested in those, uh, the marine animals. Uh, the marine animals are those like, like you know, um, those that look like whales and dolphin or sea elephant, for example. And those are like mammals that used to be uh, living on earth, but then they migrated into the water, into the ocean. So these are like mammals actually, uh, they were actually, uh, they actually related to some other animals on, 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 on earth. But nowadays they're living, they spend most of their time in, in, in water. For example, the hippo, the hippopotamus actually, they spend most of, most of the time, even they, they can walk on land, right? They have feet, they can still walk on land, they can run on land, but you know, they spend most of their time uh, in the water, and then you can see, you know, they're pretty close to um, dolphin and whales, for example. 
So this is something that, you know, I think is most interesting in, in science, in biology, because you can explain, you cannot explain anything in biology if you don't understand the evolution. And this is quite beautiful, you know, people um, study the genome sequence of, uh, of dogs. And you know that you know, our dogs are actually, uh, I think they belong to pretty much one species. Uh, yeah, our dogs are the same species. And then they just have a different breed, which is basically different traits, uh, different, um, uh, like they have different characteristics and phenotypes, but they all, you know, belong to the same species. And you can see from the top here that if you look at the frequency here, something, okay. If you look at the frequency, you're gonna, you, you can see that actually uh, coyote and wolf and dogs, they are closely related, but you know, dogs, you know, all the dogs actually come from uh, the same, I mean, the same ancestor. They actually, you know, belong to the same species and then they, diverge in terms of uh, genome to uh, because of the breeding. That's why there are so many different types of dog. That's why we call, uh, we don't say that, you know, um, uh, a pack actually, it's not, we, we don't say that, uh, we don't have a name for the packs. We don't have a species name for the pack because they, they actually has the same species as some other dogs, but we just call it a breed. Right, because they they have a different uh, characteristics due to the different inner genome, but not um, that much that we can uh, we can call it a new species. And you can you can you can find that actually many many dogs they can most of the dogs that actually can breed they can mate and give an offspring. So as long as they belong to the same species, they can give. Uh, an offspring that also reproducible, also fertile, can have another offspring. And this is kind of weird because you know you can see most of them don't, don't look don't look like they belong to the same species anymore, but they still uh, belong to the same species. So. Um, this is the idea of how you, con you construct the phylogenetic trees. Uh, you can build uh, a species tree you know, from, uh, by using the species as a label. Basically just uh, uh, the taxonomic unit here, pretty much like at the end of the brand, you can just put a species name in it and you get a species tree. Or you can use uh, sequences and other information to construct species, trees, such as uh, morphological features. Like you can look at the size, the bone, fossil, for example, to uh, identify, to build the tree of the species. And you can also use some markers like DNA markers to produce a tree as well. So as long as you have the information uh, about how uh, species are similar or different from each other, you can build a tree, right? Doesn't have to be genome sequence. Okay, this is an example. Um, you look at uh, an animal uh, that has the most recent common ancestor, which is uh, abbreviated by MRCA, the most recent common ancestor. So the most recent common ancestor is here, like right, at the yellow point. Here is that here, and then you know it's speciated uh, to into uh, one species here, and then another species go this way. And during the evolution, we actually develop or gain a fuzzy tail, right? So after this point, all the animals are gonna have a fuzzy tail because it's in from here. And then you know it's diverged one more time to uh, to give a species B, and then during the evolution on another another lineage, it actually gained a big ear. So all other animals 
our other species here, the CDE, will all have big ears and fuzzy tail, right? And then it diverge again uh, to become the species C and to become the common ancestor of the DNA. And then during the evolution, it also gained a whiskers. So the DNA both have whiskers, right? Because, you know, it happened, it actually gained the whiskers before uh, the speciation of the DNA happens. That's why uh, you can get uh, DNA both have whiskers. So at this point, you know, if you look at the DNA, you're going to see that it actually, they actually have whiskers, big ears and fuzzy tail. While um, species C only has big ears and fuzzy tail, but no whiskers. And also B has uh, fuzzy tail. And the common ancestor doesn't have anything, right? Doesn't, doesn't have tail, doesn't have big ears, doesn't have whiskers. So this is actually uh, related to what we talked about last time in terms of um, uh, paralog and, and autolog, right? We talk about the homologous sequences and we say that uh, if the, uh, the evolution happens um, like before, the speciation, uh, they're going to have an autolog because they actually gain the mutation or the gene before, uh, before the speciation happens. So they are going to share the same trait, right? So this is pretty, um, it's a pretty much the same thing, right? Just represented in different way. We, we were talking about the DNA sequences and mutation last time, but this time we talk about the morphology of, of the organism. And uh, during the evolution, in this example, we already talk about uh, gaining the features, but you know, you could lose the feature as well, not just the gaining. Like some animal could lose their tail, like, like primate. Some, uh, a group of primates actually uh, lost their tail during the ev evolution. So it's not just the gaining of the features, but also losing the feature that could happen during the evolution. And you could, you know, lose the features and gain the feature back again during the evolution as well. So it's not just um, like you have to lose it and you don't get it back like ever. It, it's not like that. You know, it's pretty much like a mutation. You know, you can mutate uh, from G to C and then back to G again and then back to T. You know, it could happen like, you know, multiple uh, events, you know, can occur during the evolution depending on how long um, the evolution process, like, you know, span at that time. If we span uh, across a very long time, you're going to see many, 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 like, multiple events of the uh, evolution happen. And that's going to uh, complicate uh, the construction of the phylogenetic tree later because, you know, most of the time we're not going to have information about, like, the multiple events or multiple mutation that occur because, you know, we don't see that, you know, they happen and they go on. We only see just um, the one that we can find, the one that we can see in nature. So if uh, multiple mutations happen and then, you know, it, it's gone, like it happened long ago and it's you know, revert back, for example, we're not going to see it anymore. We can't go back and see it anymore. So, so most of the time, we're going to have to assume that uh, the evolution happened only once. For example, in this, in this tree, this figure, you're going to have to assume that it actually acquired or gained a big ears just one time, and that's all, right? They may actually, they might have gained a big ears and lose and lost big ears and gained big ears back again, but we don't see that. We see that, okay, it has big ears, so it, we just assume that it actually happened one time. That's why I said, you know, um, before that the phylogenetic tree is going to be just a model that represents pretty much a best guess that we uh, have about the history of evolution. We don't see the whole picture. We, we, we're not going to see the whole picture, but uh, we just have a good approximate of how the history look like. And this is very important. That's why I keep talking about this topic for a long time, but you have to keep in mind every time you look at um, the publication 
or look at a phylogenetic tree. You have to keep all these concepts in mind. It's very important. And this is um, a real uh, like phylogenetic tree that built by hands, you know, from Charles Darwin. And you know that Charles Darwin actually the one that helped um, establish the evolutionary theory, the theory of evolution and also the, the mechanism of evolution such as the natural selection. So this is the notebook that he actually used to study um, the evolution of the animals uh, on, on the island, I think. So it used to be done by hand like this, and it used to be drawn by hand like this. But nowadays we have so many tools. Okay, um, we're gonna take a short break, but, uh, and we're gonna come back maybe at 14, 45, but you know, you can go and you know, to the restroom and come back. And I want you to look at this slide and then try, you know, without, without looking at another slide, because that's gonna be an answer. Uh, just, you know, for fun, try to build a phylogenetic tree from, for, for these animals, from, from all these traits. And we're gonna discuss about what you get later, okay? So take a break and then come back and try to do the exercise. Okay, um, let's take a break and come back at 14.45.
Hello, are you finished? <laughs> Are you guys back? Okay, um, so are you finished drawing uh, the phylogeny by hand? Uh, so where should we start? Hello, I cannot hear anyone. Um, okay. How? Why? Because uh, from this table, they didn't uh, appear uh, lungs, so filter give us offer. They didn't hear anything. So maybe they just uh, the origin of the living that uh, Azan gave in this uh, table. Okay. Um, this is some. Uh, this is what we. Uh, we should do. I mean, we, if we assume that uh, as the organisms evolve, they actually gain features, not losing features. Okay, because um, if we if we assume that um, as they evolve and they they lost their features, it's going to be quite different from from this one. And this one, we just assume that okay, as the evolution uh, as the organism evolve, they gain more and more features. They gain new features. So that's why you say that uh, you put you, you start from lamprey uh, because uh, it doesn't have any features in the table, right? So in this one we call uh, the lamprey is actually uh, is an out group. It's the one that actually different from the other group. It's diver diverged from long long ago. So basically, uh, the jawless is an ancestral trait, right? So um, all organisms uh, except lamprey doesn't have jaws. Hey, do we have jaws except lamprey? The lamprey doesn't have jaws. So the jawless animal is an ancestor. It's a common ancestor of all these organisms. So uh, as they evolve, you know, uh, they gain jaws. So all other organisms like sea bass, antelope, bald eagle, and alligators all have jaws. So what's next? So what trait do you think uh, happen next? From my opinion, it should be the the lung. The lung. Hmm. Why? Yeah. Why? Why? It... Because what? <laughs> Uh, okay, because was uh, we can separate the sea bass and the lamprey uh, to mm -hmm. the, uh, the 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 tree and, and the antelope the animal leaf. Okay, the antelope. Okay, yeah, that's true. Um, you can uh, you can imagine that um, as they evolve, they gain lungs and except the sea bass. So that means the sea bass actually diverged from uh, other animals before the lungs happen. And you can keep doing the same thing, right? You look at the table and you see, okay, what is the next trait that actually can separate the animal into two groups? Okay, there's a way that you can you think, you know, you just, you know, find uh, a trait that actually separate the animal into two groups. Another one is the gizzard. The gizzard actually, uh, only those that uh, related to birds and some um, reptiles has a, have a gizzard. So the antelope actually will not have a gizzard and that's why we would assume that they actually uh, diverge from eagle and alligator before the gizzard happen, right? And then the feather, okay, this one uh, do we find that um, the feather actually, the alligator doesn't have a feather, so the feather must have occurred as the eagle evolved to become an eagle. I mean, after they diverged, for, after they speciated from the common ancestor of the alligator and the eagle, they, they actually gained the feathers. Also, the same thing uh, happened with the antelope. You know, they actually has a fur, has fur. So fur actually, 
uh, occur like after a speciation happened. Right? So only the antelope, the antelope ne ne lineage has fur, but not the other lineage. So this is something that you might think, okay, uh, this is some, I mean, based on our information, this is how the phylogenetic tree look like, the phylogeny look like, but this could be true or could be wrong. It's, you know, we, we don't know, but we did our best to draw the phylogeny out of the, the data we have. But, you know, you can also do something like this. And this is um, possible, right? If you look at the table, if you look at the data in the table, you're gonna find that actually you can separate, uh, you can build another tree that looks like this, just exactly from the same data set. Um, you can separate both lamprey and, uh, I mean, the first lineage that diverged from the, the most recent common ancestor can actually diverge again to become lamprey and sea bass. And in that case, you know, the jaws had to happen uh, during the evolutionary of the sea bass. So when the, the sea bass diverge and become a sea bass, they actually gain jaws. Another way is, you know, the rest of the animals also gain jaws after they diverge from the common ancestor. Okay, so my question is, which one should be the right one? This one that you, this one or this one? The first or the second? And why the first and the second? Which one is, this one should be the one that we accept. Why? You know, these are all, you know, looking at, according to the data, they are, they are correct, right? Because they actually uh, build based uh, from, from the data in the table, but which one is correct? in your opinion. Well, I think the first one is more noticeable because they are less complicated. Oh, sorry, I cannot, I cannot hear you. Could, could you speak? <laughs> oh, I, I, think, I think the first pattern is uh, more correct than the yes than then the second picture because they get a less complicated hmm what do you mean by less complicated what is the complication i mean in the second picture we had to oh in, in the picture they separate uh two lines that are presence of the jaw and it's like why, why, why we have to set the, the jaw in the sea base one and the uh, on, on the right side one? It, I think it's a more complicated if we see this. And if we add a more animals, it will be very, very uh, complicated. Hmm. Any other thought on this one? Do you all agree? I agree with uh, my answer because uh, I think that our jaw is like a, a common uh, ancestor and we don't, uh, if we don't like uh, the two picture, the two picture uh, is like, uh, it's not conform the, uh, the same common, common ancestor. So I think the uh, picture one is uh, more correctly. You think the fish, the fish jaw and and other animals jaw are, are alike, are the same? I think that is the same. Okay. Uh, actually, uh, this is the idea that I would like you to understand. It's called the the parsimony, which means that um. um when we think about the phylogenetic tree, we always think, we always prefer the tree that uh, has the, it's more simple, right? The simple in terms of the number of events that actually happen. 
For example, in this one, you can see that jaws actually happen twice. I mean, the event actually give out the jaws has to happen twice. So for example, you have to have um, at least maybe two mutations, for example. If, the, if that mutation um, give a jaw to the animals, it has to happen twice independently. And in terms of phylogenetic tree, we say that it's, it's just not likely to happen, right? The chance that two separate events of evolution happen independently and give out exact same function is not likely to happen. It's not that it's impossible. It's possible, but it's not likely. That's why we prefer the one that actually uh, simple, like simpler, the one that has um, the smallest number of evolutionary events that happen. So in this one, we would prefer the first one better because in the first one, the uh, event that actually uh, gain the jaws, the evolutionary event that gain the jaws happen only one time. And all the other animals, the, all the, the rest of the animals also has jaw. But this one, you know, you have to have two events, at least two events for fish to have, to have jaws and for other animals to have jaws, except amphi. And this one we say is not, is possible, but not likely. You know, the chance is kind of slim. So we would prefer this one, uh, the first one better. But it doesn't mean that the second one is not possible, right? Because we learned a lot uh, earlier that uh, that's a thing that called um, convergent evolution, you know, which means that uh, uh, organs or some other traits can actually evolve independently and then you know, have exact same function or exact same uh, features even though they actually evolve independently. And that's called a convergent evolution. So this actually can happen, but it's not uh, likely. So if we can choose, we would choose the one that um, we call uh, more likely to happen, which is the one that has um, the smallest uh, number of uh, events that actually give out uh, the traits. So in this one, we would prefer the one that actually more parsimonious. The parsimonious means, you know, you only spend a few, as few as, as, as little as you want, as possible to get the exact same thing. So this one, you know, um, it's, this figure is less parsimonious because it has to spend, it has to use two events at least, you know, to gain a jaw. But the first one, you just, you know, use one event and you gain a jaw. So the first one is more parsimonious, right? You get exact same thing, but you, you use less resources, you spend less. But in the second one, you spend more to get the same thing, but you spend more. So in, in, even in, okay. Excuse me, Adam, can you uh, uh, that's why again about the meaning of the parsimonious, please, because uh, there, they have the like uh, bad connection. Oh, okay, okay. Um, actually, if you look up the term parsimony, it means uh, it means someone who actually wants to spend like to spend less to get the exact same thing. Like if you go out and if you buy something online, you would look at, you know, several like uh, vendors right, to get the, the cheapest price for the same product. That means you are parsimonious. So you want to spend less to get exact same thing, the same product. Here's also the same thing in phylogenetic tree. You want to build a tree that actually has the fewest number of events that give you the exact same uh, traits or characteristic. For example, in this one, uh, in the first speaker, you use only one event to gain jaws. But in the second figure, figure, you need to at least two events to gain jaws. So if you can choose, you know, in, I mean, sci scientists just think that it's more likely for the first one to happen than the second one. So they say the first one is more parsimonious because you, you need only one event for each characteristic, you know. But in the second figure, you need two events 
at least two events to gain jaws. And you know, if you can choose, you would you know you would choose the first one because one event is actually more likely to happen than than you have two events that independently occur. So this one is less parsimonious because you need more events to gain the same thing. And this one is more parsimonious. So this is something that you have to keep in mind when you build the phylogenetic tree because I told you before that uh, from the exact same data, like for the same sequence, for example, you can build a different kind of tree. You can build like many different form of, of tree and no one can tell you which one is the right one. So this is the one thing that, this is one thing that you have to keep in mind that um, most biologists will prefer uh, the, the parsimonious tree than the, non, the, the one that less parsimonious. Okay, um, this is a, I mean, there, there are many different types of trees and the first one is called the bifurcation or the dichotomous tree. Uh, you can look at the name of the tree is called dichotomous, which means that it's gonna branch out into two every time. Right? You're gonna see every branch is gonna branch out two at a time, like two branch at a time. Uh, that's called bifurcate or dichotomous. You know, like bi and di is like two, means two. So every time you see a branch, if they diverge, if they split, they're gonna split into two every time. No more than no, no more than two. Okay, um, this one is uh, the dichotomous tree or bifurcating tree, which mostly uh, we call it a fully resolved, which means that it has all, like enough data to explain to explain all the all the uh, all the split in, in the tree. But if you don't have enough data to explain all the split in the tree, you're gonna get you're gonna end up with um, the polytomas. You know, this is uh, the opposite of the dichotomous uh, or the multi forcating which means that at the point... Hello, oh, can you hear me? Okay. Um, uh, the multi forcating or polytomas actually means that uh, when at a split point, the branching point, you get more than two branches because uh, you don't have enough data. That's why you get more than two branches because maybe uh, you don't know where to put you know, the third one. So you just put them together. That's why you can gain, you can get uh, end up with more than two branches. So if you have more data, you may be able to split like the branch into two branches. So this is something that you just, you know, if you see a tree with more than two branches at a, at a splitting point, you can understand that that's because of, there's not enough data. And, you know, sometimes you can identify uh, the, the root of the tree. You can identify, or you care about um, the common ancestor, you can put the root to the tree, but sometimes you will see many phylogenetic, phylogenetic tree that, that, that doesn't care about the the origin of the organism, like the common origin of the organism. So they don't just, they don't put the, the root uh, into the tree. Uh, you're gonna see, okay. Um, this is a picture of the like phylogenetic tree and on the left side is actually drawn pretty much like a tree that you would imagine, like a real tree with the root at the end, right, at the, the bottom of the figure and uh, the, and it's actually going up to the top, pretty much like a tree, like growing to the top. And you can see um, some point, for example, um, like um, this is pretty hard to, to look at. Um, 
you can actually switch, you know, you can rotate the tree. For example, the truffle here could rotate to the left and you still get pretty much the same tree. So this is a common, uh, it's a common characteristic of the, the, the phylogenetic tree. You can rotate the branch, but it still has exact same meaning because when we look at the tree, we don't care about what side the truffle will be. It could be on the left side, it could be on the right side, but what we care is that uh, we care about the relationship between truffle and other, other stuff, right? Like if it's closer to the chocolate or if closer to caviar, for example. And this one, you know, is actually between chocolate and caviar. So it doesn't matter if the truffle is on the left or the right, as long as it stay in the middle between chocolate and the caviar, for example. And um, as I said before, sometimes the, the branch of the width or the, the branch of the node has some meaning, like the, the, the length of the branch can have some meaning or sometimes doesn't have any meaning. It depends on you know, what they would like to depict. Like sometimes they want to depict uh, the time in evolution, so they just, or the, the mutation rate. So the branch is not gonna be the same, but sometimes they don't care. They just want to show you the, just the relationship between uh, like trees or animals. So they don't care about the, the length of the, the tree. So there you will see like, you know, all the lengths that end up in the same place. I'll show you that in the next slide. Okay, in here, the figure G, this one, you know, the branch doesn't have any meaning. So the length of the branch doesn't, doesn't, doesn't mean anything. It just, you know, end up in the same place so that it looks easier to understand, but, but you still see the relationship, I mean, the, the, the relationship between, uh, between items are the same, but the length of the branch actually doesn't have any meaning. And for the figure F, this one is called the unrooted tree. You can see that there's no root compared to the G figure. The figure G, you know, you see a root, which is the common ancestor, which, I mean, doesn't make any sense in this one because, you know, what is what should be the common ancestor of nori and, you know, truffle caviar doesn't make any sense. That's why uh, sometimes people just, you know, build um, or draw unrooted tree because it doesn't make any sense to put a common ancestor into the into the figure. So mostly you're gonna see uh, in, in research publication, you're gonna see like figure C, figure F, and also figure G most of the time. Depending on uh, the root and the length of the branch. See, so the C here, the length of the branch has some meaning, but the G, uh, the figure G doesn't have any meaning. And the figure F doesn't have any root. No, it's just build the tree based on the relationship of the item. And this is some just the, the take home message that you have to keep in mind that the uh, analogous sequence uh, could be uh, from the convergent of evolution. And sometimes you can have multiple losses or gains of the features, not just a single loss or gain. And this is pretty difficult for, for us to see, especially if, uh, if you actually uh, lost the feature and then you gain the feature back, you won't see, you know, you, you don't have a record, a record of that uh, to, to, to know that there actually one, uh, there's a loss happened one time and then it should be put back to normal. And then also when you produce, um, when you build uh, the phylogenetic tree from genome sequence or gene sequence, you have to be careful of the parallax because the parallax, it doesn't happen uh, because of the speciation, but it happens because of the gene duplication. And that could give you some problem. Okay, um, this is just an example you know, to show you why uh, the parallel can give you a big, big problem. Uh, this is the, the figure A, you can see uh, that's a gene X, 
that um, duplicated itself one time to give uh, gene X and give uh, and gene X prime. So after duplication, you get gene X and gene X prime in green. And then the speciation happened. So the species A have both X and X prime, and the species B, you have uh, X and X prime as well, right? So this is pretty uh, normal. Uh, you can see this a lot in many, many genes. But the problem of uh, happen when you want to build the phylogenetic tree of gene X and X prime, using gene X, for example. Let me, okay. So if you have the sequences of both gene X and gene X prime, you can build the phylogenetic tree like this, uh, like figure B. It's pretty easy, right? Pretty simple. You compare the sequences of the figure gene X, uh, of, of gene X and you compare the sequences of gene X prime. And then you will know that, oh, okay, um, human and chimpanzee are very close and the gorilla actually diverge before the common ancestor of chimpanzee and human. And the same thing happened with the gene X prime because, you know, X and X prime occur after the speciation. So when you build a species tree, you're going to see the exact same uh, picture of the speciation, which is the gorilla actually diverged before the common ancestor of the human and chimpanzee. So this is okay, you know, if you have sequence of X and X prime. You're gonna see the exact same thing, right? Uh, the X on one side and the X prime on the other side, telling you the exact same story. But problem usually arise when you don't have all the sequences in hand. For example, you may have gene X from chimpanzee, and then you have X prime from human and X prime from gorilla, and you don't know that X and X prime actually a parallel. So when you build a phylogenetic tree, you're gonna see another a new story, which tell you that um, chimpanzee actually diverged, you know, before the common ancestor of human and gorilla. So at this one, you know, in figure C, you're gonna see that human and gorilla are actually closer than human and chimpanzee than in, in the figure B. That, that's because of the parallel. Because in X prime, actually, uh, you already have X prime from human and gorilla, but as, uh, you have uh, X gene from the chimpanzee. So when you build a tree, it's going to be different, and it's going to be it's going to give you another story, a new story, and now you're going to conclude that human and gorilla average are actually closer than chimpanzee, which is not true, right? Because if you look at the gene X and gene X prime. I mean, if you look at the real history, you know that chimpanzee and human are actually closer. But because of the parallel, you could mislead you to think that human and gorilla are actually closer. So this actually happened a lot. That's why uh, when you build uh, the species tree using genes, uh, gene sequences, you have to make sure that all the sequences are uh, orthologue, not parallel. That's why uh, we talk a lot about the orthologous sequences before, because this is going to be very important when you uh, use um, uh, sequences to build the phylogenetic tree. And that's why BLAST wants to give you only the homologous sequences, which are orthologous. I mean, BLAST can give you homologous sequences, but you have to tell uh, which one is actually orthologous. You know, BLAST cannot tell you which one is parallel or which one is orthologous. You just have to, you know, uh, make sure that you, you, you know. That's why uh, if you choose the, the wrong sequences to build a tree, you're going to get the wrong uh, model of the evolution. And this is not easy, you know. It's not easy at all to compare, to, to tell uh, if the gene uh, are parallel or orthologue. You have to have a lot more information. And you know, we talked about this one uh, already, so we can, I'm gonna skip this, just to remind you. Okay. Um,
I'm not sure what I'm talking about in this, this one. Oh, this one is uh, the one that we already talked about last time as well. It's called the homopathy. And I put a slide here because just to remind you that this kind of thing can happen and it's gonna screw up your phylogenetic tree, right? Because um, the homopathy is something that quite difficult to identify because you know, it's the, the, the mutation happens, you know, in a place that actually makes two sequences to look like, two sequences to look alike, even though they're not, they're not orthologue, they're actually paralog. And that's gonna be a very big problem. That's why I say it's not easy at all for you to identify uh, the paralog from, I mean, to differentiate the paralog from the other lock. Um, you need a lot more information. So just one gene may not be able to help you uh, distinguish uh, differentiate the parallel from the autolog because of you know these kind of events and you know this happens a lot you know in in real nature it happens a lot and it's very hard unless you study you know unless you have a lot more information from other like closely related organism and also in our group and you can combine all those information together and you see something doesn't go uh, in the right place and you know that there might be something wrong and then you can go and look into that. So that's why I said, you know, it takes, it could, you, could take a, you could get a PhD from just building the phylogenetic tree. <laughs> it could take you many years to, um, to master how to build a good phylogenetic tree. Okay, um, we're, not, we're not gonna continue uh, to use the, we're not gonna learn how to use the software today and I'm gonna give you an, a simple exercise so that we can discuss tomorrow and then we can continue uh, uh, let me see how many how much we have left okay uh, we're gonna continue uh, to uh, that we're going to continue talking about phylogenetic tree tomorrow as the, also uh, the multi, multiple sequence alignment because it's pretty closely related topics and it doesn't take, it doesn't take long for you to, to play with the, the tool to build a uh, multiple sequence alignment. I already uploaded the sequences um, to the Google Classroom and we're going to use those sequences tomorrow. And there's some tools that we're going to learn and you can play with to build the multiple sequence alignment like this. And we're gonna use the result from the alignment to build the phylogenetic tree. It doesn't take that long to play with the, the tool. But the problem is the, you know, how you know that your sequence is actually correct and how can you uh, conclude anything from the tree is gonna be a lot more important. And today we already did this one, uh, we already performed we already did the exercise right in the beginning of the class, which is the TP53 protein. And we already did that. So, um, okay, so here is an exercise for that. I would like you to, uh, to play with, and it could take you about 40 minutes, I mean, maybe less, and to answer these, uh, these questions. And you can, you can submit like, today or maybe tomorrow morning. So that's why I can look at it when, before we come to class. Just, you know, download the sequence and then uh, answer this question. Um, I would, I mean, there are two sequences in the file and you can choose, like, you can do both, but you can choose just one to submit for your assignment, okay? You don't have to submit both sequences, just one. So use one sequence from the file and then um, you try to use the nucleotide BLAST first. I mean, there's, there are many different programs in BLAST, but you can choose the nucleotide because the sequence is nucleotide, nucleotide sequence. So you use the nucleotide BLAST first and then you can uh, use the BLAST X or the translated protein uh, BLAST to search for uh, the, the protein database. And then you can try to uh, 
use uh, two different metrics is like Lossum 62 and PAM 250, for example, and see what you get in terms of the result, right? The number of maybe the number of um, sequences you get, or look at the taxonomy, like what you see. You see any like new um, organisms that appear after you change the matrices in the taxonomy, for example. Uh, try to limit. I mean, because it's, it's going to take you so long and it's kind of slow, try to limit the search target to maybe no more than 250, 250. I think it should be fine. And how do you, how do you determine the conserved regions in the sequence? Uh, you can like, you know, capture the, the screen and then answer all these questions in, in uh, maybe in Microsoft Word in a doc file and insert all the screen that you think is, is going to help me understand what you did. <laughs> okay, so just try and, you know, capture the screen and explain what you see and what you get from, you know, uh, running the blast, two different blasts and two different matrices. So uh, you can submit like by tomorrow morning, okay, before class, so I can, I can look at that and we can uh, discuss uh, you can send me, uh, you send to my email or you can, uh, yeah, just, just send to my email because some of you cannot get into Google Classroom yet. So just send to my email. So any question? If not, I'm going to let you go and work on the assignment. You should be done before four o'clock. So uh, you don't have to have any, um, class work to do. Okay, if there's no question, um, we're gonna end today now and then you're gonna go work on your own <laughs> exercise. Okay, so try to do it as, I mean, you can talk, you can discuss, but try to do it on your own by, by yourself so you know, you know what happened. But you can, you can ask, you can discuss in, in something that you, um, you don't understand. Okay. Uh, in, in the Google uh, link that you give, they have two sequence. Mm -hmm. I just uh, choose only one to do the, uh, the exercise, right? Yep, yep, just one. And you should tell me, you know, you just uh, note, note in, in your excitement, like which sequence you choose, okay? So I can, I can tell, <laughs> otherwise I will not know which one you choose. So uh, not, not the name of the sequence in your, in your assignment as well. And when you look at the sequence, you know, uh, I just want to add one more, one more um, question here. You should, you should, uh, at least you know you should you should think about what what kind of uh, what is the function of the sequence? Right? What is the function of the, the sequence? Is it a gene or it's not a gene? Or if it's a gene, what it is its function? What would its function be? Okay, so it would be um, what would be the function of the sequence? Okay. Okay, just um, one more question I want to ask because I think you should be able to tell, you should be able to tell like what would be the function of the sequence? Is it um, a gene or is it not a gene? Or if it's a gene, what does it do? What would it do? Okay, so it shouldn't take you so long. Maybe like, just want you to play with blast a little bit more and uh, be familiar with it. Okay, and then we're gonna come back tomorrow at 1 p.m. to finish uh, this part. And uh, we're not gonna talk about the sequence analysis anymore. I think we're gonna, um, you may have to, uh, we may discuss that a little bit in the protein uh, structure that Ajahnapat is gonna teach you. 
um, I think you can still, you may have to uh, apply some of what you learn in that class, but we're going to be done by tomorrow in terms of um, sequence alignment and phylogenetics. Okay. And I already posted uh, two videos on Google Classroom. So if you uh, want to review some idea, some concept, uh, you can you can go look look at the, the videos. I didn't actually edit the video at all, so um, you may have to like skip some part by yourself. I and mean, uh, it, it's a it's a comp it's a full read video from the beginning to the end. I didn't edit anything. I didn't have time to actually uh, cut some part of the video out. Okay, um, I'll see you tomorrow and. Do you have like half an hour to work on your assignment? Okay, see you tomorrow. Bye bye. Okay.